In July 2015, a women's health education evening was held in the Western Bay of Plenty to introduce the Bay Navigator Menorrhagia pathway. In the following 30-minute video, GPs Tim Chiari and Alison James go through the pathway, followed by a presentation by Dr Bill McCauley on the latest surgical treatments for menorrhagia, and finally, faster cancer treatment initiatives by Dr Guy Fasher. Clinical presentation. So what is, what is menorrhagia? It's defined as excessive menstrual blood loss which interferes with a woman's physical, emotional, social <laughs> or material quality of life occurring at regular intervals over at least two cycles. And that taught me something because um, one cycle is not enough. It needs to be a, a, a sort of ongoing process. Um, possible causes. Um, so uh, we split these into gynecological causes, systemic causes and other causes. The gynecological causes, which I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, endometrial hyperplasia. Um, uterine fibroids accounts for about 30% of, uh, of cases. Um, uterine polyps, which accounts for another 10%, so that's 40% already. Um, endometrial cancer, which is rare, but important. Polycystic ovary syndrome, adenomyosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, and any complications of early pregnancy or miscarriage. Um, so those, those are relatively common. Those, are, those account for most of them, I would say, Bill. Is that, is that probably, probably true? Systemic causes are relatively rare. Bleeding disorders, um, anticoagulation medication, reasonably common. Um, hypothyroidism, liver disease, and renal disease is rare. And other causes, such as intrauterine device, um, especially in the first six months of, of uh, positioning of the device, um, and other hormonal contraception, like um, Judel or Depo. Um, the history and examination, um, so pertinent to this is really, um, I'll focus on the things which um, the gynaecologist wants to see in their referral letters. Um, so focusing first of all, where's red, where are red flags? Where'd they be? So I'm going to take red flags first because these are the really important stuff for, for GPs to sort of focus on. Um, anyone with menorrhagia over the age of 45? Anyone with menorrhagia aged over 35 who are either nulliparous, infertile, uh, with known polycystic ovary disease, um, or who have either used uh, tamoxifen or uh, unopposed estrogens in the past. Um, people with intermenstrual bleeding or postcoital bleeding could, should be dealt with separately. There, are, there is an excellent um, pathway, I haven't looked at it recently, but um, there's uh, the uh, Midland uh, for, yeah, there's a, a map of medicine. Uh, there's a link on the on the uh, Bay Navigator to map of medicine for those particular pathways. And I, I believe uh, postcoital bleeding is another pathway that's kind of going to be worked on quite soon. Um, uh, there's a condition called Lynch syndrome that I haven't heard of. By this, anyone heard of Lynch syndrome? Oh, good. That makes me feel better. <laughs> uh, that is um, a first degree relative with endometrial or bowel cancer. Uh, less than 60 years old and menorrhagia. It's potential Lynch syndrome, so uh, that's we have to look out for. We should be asking for family history of those things in patients with menorrhagia. Um, so those are red flags for history. At examination, uh, the biggest red flag being a pelvic mass. I'm sure that would all alarm all of us. Um, also, age 35 and uh, obesity. So we define that as weight more than 90 kilograms. Um, uh, and anyone with menorrhagia and um, uh, severe anemia, so defined as haemoglobin less than uh, 80. Um, so what other things are we looking at for the history? Um, forgive me if I'm uh, going over ground which you're all familiar with, but uh, so we need to know the bleeding history. Um, so how heavy is the bleeding? Try and estimate that with clots, flooding, um, any intermenstrual bleeding, uh, uh, postcoital bleeding. Dysmenorrhea, uh, history of dyspareunia, uh, the gravidity of the lady for the reasons we discussed before. Um, uh, fertility is desired from for, for, for this point on because certain treatments will affect that. Um, medications, particularly, as we've said already, the use of tamoxifen uh, or unopposed estrogens in the past. The current con contraception, the smoking history, uh, family history of endometrial cancer uh, or bowel cancer uh, for Lynch syndrome. Um, known polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome. Uh, uh, history of bleeding disorder and so on. Uh, in examination, um, uh, please view the cervix uh, and take a, a smear if, if indicated uh, or, or, if, or if overdue. 
Uh, pelvic examination uh, is, is standard in everybody, and an, obviously an abdominal examination too. And investigations, a uh, pregnancy test um, is, uh, it would, would be useful, uh, please. A full blood count, ferritin, uh, and then other things are, are less important. Consider a TSH, um, consider coagulation screening, and apparently three to five percent of menorrhagia presents, uh, presents patients have a coagulation disorder, which I didn't know, um, and take swabs if clinically indicated. When referring to gynae, um, please ensure essentially that all those features that we've just discussed are, uh, are, are present. An ultrasound um, is to be included with the referral only if uh, a pelvic mass is palpable. I think that's correct. That's right, isn't it? So if not, um, so you don't have to worry about ultrasound outside of that sphere uh, because the gynecologists, some of the gynecologists have the capacity to do ultrasounds themselves within clinic. And if not, those that don't will refer to ultrasound as part of that uh, first specialist appointment. Um, pelvic mass is defined as greater than 12 week size. Yeah. And, um, you know, if the, he the haemoglobin was dropping, um, then you can initiate treatment at that stage. And um, obviously, if it's really acute, heavy bleeding, it might be an indication of serious pathology at that time. Um, so you've got three options for treatment to, to start with straight away, um, as indicated there. And when you go on to the um, uh, pathway, you can click on these and it will give you um, sort of expanded dosages and then links to New Zealand formulary. Um, you can give um, tranexamic acid as well as the um, hormone treatment um, if you're really needing something to bring it under control. Um, and then really you, you want to see, is, is it responding to treatment? Hopefully it would. Um, in which case you're going to put the referral in because this is an unusual presentation. If it's not, then it's appropriate at that time to speak to the on-call um, team at the hospital and um, they'll be able to give you some advice about what's, what the next step will be. So that's in, a, in an acutely um, significant bleed. Otherwise, if you're dealing with just the standard definition that Tim talked about, um, <clears throat> you've got... Um, any patients who don't fit into that, those red flag groups um, can basically then go on to trial medical treatments, and we're all pretty familiar with these. Um, easily uh, divided into um, hormonal and non-hormonal treatment. Um, a few things I thought was were just an interesting uh, um, points with the non-hormonal. Um, obviously, we know the tranexamic acid. There are some contraindications, mainly being previous history of thromboembolic disorder. Um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, you shouldn't give tranexamic acid. Um, in the pathway, there's a link to the New Zealand formulary again, which expands um, on all these points. Um, Anti-inflammatory, some evidence to suggest the naproxen and PONSTAM, um, which we know will be helpful for dysmenorrhea, but they also can be helpful for menorrhagia. Um, and both of those are acceptable if, even if a woman is thinking about conceiving um, because they're going to be taken at the first part of the cycle and you can combine them as well which may increase the efficacy so that was a useful point I thought and then we come on to hormonal treatment um, which again each of these things can then be expanded in the pathway um, I'll just highlight a few things with the hormonal treatment um, Marina um, I looked at the special authority, and I think it may have changed. There's a link to the special authority on the pathway. Um, Haemoglobin now has to be less than 12, which I think may have changed recently, and ferritin is less than 16. Um, obviously, no red flags. Um, if there's no abnormality on examination, there's no need to do an ultrasound before you put Marina in. And um, on, the, on the pathway, there is then a link to... Um, I'm, I'm presuming most, most of us here or DPs will put marinas in, but if you have, if there's a practice who doesn't put marinas in, there's a link to GPs who are happy to put marinas in outside of their own registered patients. And on that table, there is um, some of the practices have put costs associated with that. So that's quite useful. And basically, this is, this is for, to, to streamline the process for a patient, to give them more choices so that they're not having to wait four to six months in a situation where they would have in the past to see a, a gynecologist. Um, the, then the other hormonal treatments, you've got the con combined pill, 
You can always try cycle packs together, as I'm sure we're all familiar with. Progesterone and only pill, probably getting down to third line as the depo and norocisterone. Um, and again, they've got the dosages and um, of all of these um, options. We've also included treatment of iron deficiency, which sort of goes part and parcel, and um, expanded in that box. There's information on all of the um, different formulations which are available, um, subsidised and non-subsidised, and a little bit of information about parenteral um, iron, which I don't know whether too many practices are doing. Does anybody do infusions, iron infusions, their practices, yep. So there's, there's also some really useful links there um, through this and also at, at the beginning there's some provider resources and within that there's a very good article from BPAC about investigating anemia and within that there's some very useful um, uh, links through to, uh, to the uh, parenteral infusion if you need to have any more information about that. So, um, and then, that's really the end of the treatment, and then really it's about monitoring after three months and um, reassessing, which I guess we all do, um, working your way through some of those options, but if there's no response, it's then appropriate to um, refer on uh, to, to the gynaecologist. Um, and that first referral, I think that you referral, um, is Caroline's going to to there. Okay, so I'm just going to take you through the um, e-referral. It's not live yet. It will be live any day, but we're just making the final changes to it. Um, so <clears throat> the e-referral basically reflects, reflects the pathway. So if you're completing the e-referral, you are by default following the pathway because it includes all of the information. Um, Bill did have a, a questionnaire that they used in clinic as well, so we utilised that as well, so that they had a list of questions that they asked, so we made sure that all of those questions as well were on this. So the e-referral is in four main parts. It's in your, uh, starts off with your section one, which is your referral eligibility. So this is the bit you're going to fill in first, and these are the questions that you'll have to ask. The first is, does the patient have a copper IUCD in place? Is the patient greater than or equal to 45 years? Has the patient trialled and failed three months of medical therapy? That's at any age. Has the patient had associated postcoital or intermenstrual bleeding at any age? Does the patient have a first degree relative diagnosed with failed or endometrial cancer at the age of less than 60? That's the Lynch syndrome that Tim was referring to. Is the patient older or equal to 35 years? Does the patient have a pelvic mass greater than um, 12 weeks size uterus? Is the hemoglobin less than 80? And is this an excessive bleed outside of the definition of menorrhagia? So those are the questions you're going to be asked initially. If you answer yes to the first question, does the patient have a copper IUCD in place? It will come up with, you must remove the IUCD and reassess after three months before making the referral. So they don't, unless the patient isn't going to get seen if they've got an IUCD, unless the IUCD has been removed for three months to make sure that that's not the cause. If you tick the yes box, is the patient greater than or equal to 35 years, then you'll come up with these questions here, because all patients over 45 need to be referred. All those patients over 35 with any one of these also need to be referred. So if you've got a patient over 35, you look at these indications here. And if you can tick any of those, then, you, then um, your referral will, will get through as well. So it starts off here, moves on to those of the questions and the uh, extra bits that pop up dependent on your answer. If you go through this section and you put no in all of those, it will then come up and say, as you have answered no to all of the above, please trial three months of medical therapy, and you can refer to the Bay Navigator pathway for your options, and you can link to it right from there, prior to the referral, as the patient will not meet the criteria for specialist assessment. So it's just saying, try something for three months before you make this referral. If you've tried something for three months and it hasn't worked, well, then you do meet the, um, the criteria for referral. The next section after that is your additional history. So having 
had your uh, uh, filled in the criteria and your referral is going to get, be um, accepted, the, this is the additional information that um, the specialists would like to receive. They'd like to know the cycle length in days, whether there are any clots, whether there's any flooding, the impact on the quality of life, whether fertility is desired, um, the gravida parity and current contraception. The next part is the examination. So the examination things that need to be completed, um, you need to put in the weight, you need to put in uh, the ab whether the abdominal examination, the pelvic examination, and whether the specular examination is normal or not. Now, the next part of the e-referral is the investigations. So um, this asks you, is there a pelvic mass greater than 12 weeks? And if you answer yes to that question, um, and I'm, I'm hoping this is going to happen, ideally a um, pelvic ultrasound request will be generated at the same time. So you won't actually need to do anything, just by ticking that box, automatically itself, it, it sends through a radiology referral. Now I'm hoping this is right, they've not done this before, and I'm just waiting back to hear that this is, they've, they've filled it, these forms are completed in um, Dunedin. We don't do them here. There's one little unit that does them. So they've got all the technology to be able to do it. So we ha we're very, very dependent on them. They're very clever. But um, yeah, they've not done this before and we've asked whether they can. They've put it on the form, so we're assuming that it can be done. But we just want to make sure before it goes out there that it is actually going to happen. The, the, the referral will, will be sent to two places. So basically it will be sent to radiology and it will be sent at the same time to um, the clinic. So they both will have the same information to save you having to double up your information. It need, the form has told you it needs to be done, it's going, you know, it, it fulfills the criteria, well then you don't need to go back. And I'm hoping that's going to happen, okay, but I can't make any promises yet. But we're trying to, to we're, you know, technology is moving on, so we're trying to keep pace with it and um, not have to do so much work and, um, and not have to double up with things. Um, the other um, results that you need to um, complete or attach would be a pregnancy test, a haemoglobin result, a ferritin, and the latest smear result. Those are mandatory. Um, a clotting profile, a TSH, and swabs should be included. So moving on. So if you um, answer no to the, your ultrasound with your, your mass, um, then you then it explains um, that um, you're not going to get a pelvic ultrasound. This is because further investigation and endometrial biopsy will be indicated irrespective of the ultrasound scan result. I a normal ultrasound will not obviate the need for further investigations, and therefore it does not assist the management decisions. The specialist will order the ultra pelvic ultrasound scan if it's felt to be necessary. So I think that was part of our drive with the pathway was to make ultras, a pel pelvic ultrasound scans are um, a lot are ordered, but it's about which ones actually will make a difference to what happens to this patient. And we wanted to make sure that those who really did have the risk factors got um, access to the scans. So there was a, 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 there was a reason why we decided not to have a scan on everybody because it's not going to make any difference to the management. It's, even with a normal result, they're still going to need to be seen. So um, just the learning outcomes from um, the menorrhagia pathway. So identify when a patient with menorrhagia should be referred to secondary services and the information that should be provided to enable appropriate prioritisation of referrals and understand which patients with menorrhagia should be referred to pelvic ultrasound scanning and understand the rationale behind the limited access for primary care. So hopefully that's explained thing. As I say, if once we've got the e-referral up, the e-referral is the pathway. So hopefully you won't even need to refer to the pathway. But the pathway does give you that extra information. As Alison said, there's a list on there of all the GPs in the area who are prepared to put myrenas in for those outside of their surgeries as well. Um, there's a link to the natural formula for every single one of the medications. So if you want to have a look at those, you can just go straight there and click on those. So. Um, I encourage you to have a look at the pathway and just work your way around it, um, have familiarise yourself with it, and then um, it hopefully it will be of, of use to you as well. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, those of you that don't know me, I'm Bill McCauley. I'm one of the consultant obstetricians. Uh, I'm not the only consultant obstetrician in the room. Brad Sheddington is sitting quietly at the back there, so he is. So if you have any questions, please just ask Brad, will you? Uh, this is actually his talk that he gave to a grand round about a year ago. 
so we, I've added a little bit, a little bit in. I have no disclosures uh, to reveal at all about this. But what we're looking to do is to see the patients that we actually want to see or need to see as gynaecologists, i.e. the patients that we can do something for that cannot be done in the primary sector, okay? uh, i.e. the patients that need an operation, okay? because we're surgeons, we hope. So what are our surgical options okay, for menorrhagia? Well, this is Gordon Ramsay, those that don't know him, and he's a very fiery chef, isn't he? You know, so he needs to calm down a bit, and we can calm the endometrium down. Okay? Uh, Alison mentioned all those wonderful uh, drugs that we can use, all those non-hormonal and hormonal drugs, which may or may not be effective. Probably the best, I think, is transanamic acid, as you all know, and it generally works in about, what, 30% to 40% of the population? depending if they have any other pathology. But it's a good drug to try. And certainly, that's the one that I see patients in private practice, I would put them on first of all, okay? So we can calm it down a bit. We can also use the Mirena to calm it down. And I'll talk a wee bit about the Mirena later, okay? We can fry it, we can boil it, we can microwave it, believe it or not. We can actually microwave it. When I was a registrar, we were doing this thing called microsilis, dreadful device. It didn't buzz or anything, but it was just an awful device. We can laser it, but like Luke Skywalker, or we can remove it. Now, gynecologists are very, very clever people. These are the various devices that can be used to fry, microwave, zap it, basically. The Mirena, of course, we all know, calms it down. Thermoblates, Thermochoice are balloons with hot water in them, okay? Novasure has been on the market oh, 15 years now. It's either two or four million people I heard this uh, week have had a Novasure performed on them. Uh, Microsilis is the microwave one uh, that I used in the UK, not with great success. So we talk a wee bit about the Mirena. It's generally quite good, isn't it? You know, it, 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 it's certainly, it's good and it's bad because it's bad for our trainees because they don't get the number of hysterectomies that they used to do. But for the patient, it can be quite good. You know, it reduces 80% bleeding in three months and 90% over a six month period. Okay, these are Shearing's figures, by the way. Okay, so this is the drug company figures. This is what the drug company tells you it does. But what the drug company doesn't tell you is there is a 60% discontinuation rate Okay, so six out of 10 ladies are unhappy with it. I'd say in my private practice, for every 10 I put in, I, put th I take three out, 30%. It's not just due to intermenstrual bleeding. Brad will tell you well, everybody knows here in the room. Shearing will tell you that you don't get any side effects with it. Okay, but we all see people who have breast pain, mood disturbance, abdominal distension, what else, headaches, migraines intermenstrual bleeding. So it's for all these reasons that we take these out. But it's, it's there, it's there. Oh, missed a slide, hold on. Then we have the ablative techniques, of which the most popular is Novasure. This is a Novasure device, obviously, in the bottom here. It, it's, it's very clever, uh, bipolar high impedance ultrasoundy sort of thing. Uh, it's probably the best, if you look at the results, they tell you it's the best. It certainly is the most widely used. Uh, it does achieve an amenorrhea rate, uh, probably of about 56% over a 12, year, 12 month period, okay? And that compares with about a quarter with the balloons. Uh, satisfaction rate, 94%, okay? So 94% of ladies, if they have had an overshare, are happy, nine out of 10, okay? But one in 10 are unhappy with it, so there is a 10% failure rate with it. Is that acceptable? What do you think? Yes. Oh, I used to do these in the UK. I, I did, I mean, I used to do, I've done every, almost every one of those. Brad's probably done them as well, you know, all of them. Uh, 
I do a different thing now. I do the thermal blade, I think it's called, because it's idiot proof when I'm getting older, you know. Uh, uh, but, the, you know, the, there's, definitely a, there's definitely a role for this, okay? So we have the Myrina, which works in about, what did I say, uh, you, you know, 60% with are unhappy over a five-year period. Uh, this isn't guaranteed, so they're, they're not guaranteed. So what, what are we left with? Well, we're, we're left with hysterectomy, aren't we? You know? And hysterectomy, I think, is changing and needs to change, okay? The route that we do a hysterectomy by, we don't want to be doing big, massive incisions in ladies who stay in hospital for five days, get an ileus, need a blood transfusion, get a urinary tract infection, or six weeks off work, okay? So you were very clever as gynecologists. This is actually a photograph of me after an obstetric on call. Okay? <laughs> The way I feel. But we're very wise, and very clever as gynecologists, because we're, you know, I think we're the only, only surgical field that can think of doing one operation about 20 ways. Okay, and that is hysterectomy. Okay, so this is Brad's slide. Okay, so I can't even remember what half these are. You know, so S T A H is a subtotal hysterectomy. Then we have the robot, but we shouldn't be calling it the robot. What should we be calling it now, Brad? the Da Vinci assisted surgical procedure or something like that. Then we have a total abdominal hysterectomy, laparoscopic subtotal hysterectomy, laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy, vaginal hysterectomy and total laparoscopic hysterectomy. Okay, so these are the easy ones to do, subtotal, okay? That's a four clamp operation. Takes about half an hour to do, okay? But we see as we go up the food chain, it becomes quite difficult. So the highest one of the most technically difficult one is the total laparoscopic hysterectomy today, okay? But as I'll show you in this talk, that probably is the most beneficial one for the patients, without doubt. It's interesting that the robot is number two in the list, isn't it? Because the robot makes a bad laparoscopic surgeon look really good. This again is Brad's slide. This is about hysterectomy today and how many hysterectomies we're doing in New Zealand. Uh, four per thousand women, okay? Very similar to the States and lags well behind Norway and certain other EU countries. Looking at the adoption of uh, minimally invasive surgery for hysterectomy in the States, okay? So we look at the last sort of 20 years and what you can see is the blue line is steadily declining. There are the old-fashioned total abdominal hysterectomies. You can see that the vaginal hysterectomy rate is staying relatively static at about 20% there. And they rise since the early 2000s in the robot. And that's reflected in these slides uh, as well. You can see nearly 40% currently of hysterectomies done in the United States are done robotically. And that has been at the expense of the blue ones, which is the total abdominal hysterectomy. Surgeons must progress beyond traditional techniques of cutting, sewing, to future with minimally invasive access to abdominal cavity is only the beginning. And certainly this has been reflected. If you look at the, uh, the surgical departments throughout the world, really, or the Western world, you know, they, they're just flying ahead or doing all their laparoscopic coles, you know, and their lap appendixes. Whereas we've been really slow to take up the, uh, take up the laparoscopic route, which is really interesting because the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy was done by a gynecologist. Yeah. <laughs> Technology has certainly made it easier, and these are a few things that Brad uses uh, to do his laparoscopic hysterectomies uh, make this, the procedure very straightforward. I'll skip over that. Uh, some, there are some contraindications to lap histes. Uh, if you have a really large uterus, 24 weeks, or to the umbilicus, and that relates to the problems with this device, the morselator, so you actually have to put that in and drag the, drag the uterus out with it, basically. And large adnexal masses, of course, you know. Uh, saying that, Mr. Chittington and I done a case with Brad done it yesterday where he took an 800 gram fibroid uterus out, which was probably about 20 weeks size. 
we saw the patient, I saw the patient last night and today, and she's eating, drinking, and could go home tomorrow. And she has four, four incisions in her belly, small incisions. This doesn't play, but this is a ligature. This is a device that we use to do all the pedicles uh, and stuff down the side. That's the Morse later in action, so it's a big tube that goes in. That's a fibroid, and it sucks it up and cups it. That's the V care, which is the manipulator in the back of the uterus. So the advantages of lap hysterectomy. This is why we should be doing this. Okay, reduce pain. Okay, these patients do not have a PCA. Okay, these patients are not like an abdominal hysterectomy or a vag hysterectomy. Okay, they are up and around very quickly. They get fed the evening after their surgery. The lady from yesterday was eating her tea when I saw her. Okay, and that took a while. That was three hours, Brad, wasn't it? So there's no doubt that it's probably a safer operation because you can see the anatomy better down the laparoscope because of the magnification and because of the screens that we use. Okay, the new HD screens are amazing. So you can see the ureters, you can see all the blood vessels. There are disadvantages, of course. It takes slightly longer do okay but we've got slides and this the fastest one that brad and i have done i think together with me the bomb man brad doing it obviously is i think 40 minutes 40 45 minutes i think that was for an endometrial cancer patient and it wasn't a rush okay it was not a rush the, ex the equipment is expensive and there certainly is a longer learning curve with it for us so what should we be doing uh th these are cochrane reviews if anybody's interested they're all out there you know uh, this compares vice hist against abdominal hist, strongly favours uh, uh, basically vaginal hysterectomy in terms of uh, hospital stay, uh, laparoscopic versus abdominal, strongly favours laparoscopic, laparoscopic versus abdominal again, strongly favours laparoscopic uh, for return to your normal activities. Uh, there is a substantial, you know, group and growing evidence that laparoscopic surgery is the best way to treat these patients. Okay. So this is, again, this is, this is all Brad's work. You know, he, 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 he's done all this and I'm starting up here presenting basically. Uh, so TLH at Toronto, when Brad arrived, he, he was our minimally invasive uh, chap who arrived from the UK. Uh, wasn't a standard procedure. He had lots of early challenges with it, getting the equipment, getting the dedicated theatre staff. I think, Brad, you would agree with this, that when you have a dedicated staff who know what you do day in, day out, it makes it so much easier. Yeah? When they know your setup, know how to position the patient, know what, how to use the insufflator, how to use all the equipment associated with these cases, it makes it so much easier. You look at the cost, the cost is similar to a total abdominal hysterectomy. Vaginal hysterectomy is really cheap, you know, it's a really cheap operation to have done. This is single incision laparoscopic surgery, okay? So this is your traditional, obviously, bottom right. That's the laparoscopic, three scars, one in the belly button. Uh, and that's the single inside incision where there are no scars on your tummy. Uh, I think that that's the take-home message, you know. What we should do as, as surgeons, you know. You should always do your best for your patient. Uh, so you, you probably all know that the government a little while ago came up with uh, some things called the Faster Cancer Treatment Guidelines, and they're around trying to get uh, access to uh, investigations and treatment for patients with possible or probable cancer faster and more efficiently. Um, I have been employed part-time by the DHB while being an RMO in a quality improvement um, role. I work with Joe Bourne and his service development unit to try and, and uh, work on various pro projects, but this has been the one I've spent the most time on this year. Um, so although I'm talking about a, gynecolo a gynecological problem and postmenopausal bleeding, this is really a trial run for faster cancer treatment and the whole DHB for lots of different services. So I started off trying to think of, you know, what's the most uh, straightforward uh, gynecological faster cancer treatment area? And really for me, it seemed to be postmenopausal bleeding. Uh, four to 10 percent of women are presenting with this issue. 10 percent of those will have cancer. So straight away, you've got a population group who are high risk. Um, if you look at the international guidelines for who should be seen by gynecologists, 
NICE say anyone with postmenopausal bleeding over 55, and Ministry of Health sort of agrees there as well. So they set up these, these guidelines for which there are a whole lot of different targets. Um, initially, a 31-day to making a decision about what to do and a 62-day target uh, to making a intervention, i.e. surgery or whatever needs to be done. Um, but there are a whole lot of smaller targets as well. And the DHBs have to meet these targets 85% um, by July next year and 90% by the next year after that. I'll show you why that's difficult. So this is how complex the um, targets are. I don't understand all of it, despite the fact that I've been working on it for six months. But um, the part that I'm working on is standard one and standard two, which are around how fast they get in to see us uh, in clinic and how fast people get seen in radiology. So some TIs did an audit for us, uh, and they looked at who's getting seen in clinic, how fast are they being seen, and do they come with scans. Um, you'll see here that only 35, 36% of people are coming to us with a scan within the two-week time period and being seen with us within the two-week time period. So that's a long way off reaching the 85 or 90% that we're expected to by July. So how are we going to fix this? Um, you guys are using a BPAC referral system for a whole lot of things. Um, you're already using the postmenopausal bleeding e-referral for radiology which is really nice, you just tick a box that says postmenopausal bleeding and radiology receives your referral and says, thank you, we'll do this. So I thought, why can't we do this for the gynaecology service? Um, and I've been working on this over the, next, uh, over the last six months. So, oh, that's the, end. Uh, the goal is to link the two referrals, so actually all you'll need to do is do a single referral to us as the gynaecology service, um, which will fire off a referral one to us for a first specialist appointment and two to radiology for the ultrasound. Uh, and hopefully it'll get your patients uh, ultrasounds and specialist appointments within the two-week period, meeting the requirements, but also getting the patients faster treatment and hopefully uh, determining whether they have cancer and making interventions for that sooner. If this works, um, we'll expand it to the rest of the, well, ideally the rest of the gynaecology service first, and then from there the rest of the faster cancer treatment guidelines for the hospital. Thank you.